everyone. This is Chaitali Bagh from the European Bureau of Aviation and Defense Universe based out of Cyprus. Since yesterday, we are very closely monitoring the Russia-Ukraine crisis. Whatever is happening around the world, loss of human life, uncertainties, sanctions, everything that is coming one by one. We have with us right now, retired Lieutenant General Sayed Atta Hasnan to discuss what is happening with the conflict. Thank you so much, sir, for coming again to the show. We are really privileged to have you here. To take the discussion ahead, we have with us Sangeeta Saxena, editor, Aviation and Defense Universe, to take the discussion forward. Welcome, ma'am. Thank you very much, Atali. And uh, sir, welcome back to ADU's chat room. Very the much. last time we were here, sir, we talked on presumption. And we said, okay, this is what is happening at the moment, but then it could or could not be a war. Now, today, when we are back with you on the show, sir, the war is there. Russia yesterday invaded Ukraine. And of course, since then, you know, the world has no other headline. So what is this? How is it going to affect the global uh, scenario? See, uh, Sangeeta, what happens is that... Uh, we discussed it last time that this is all going to be about brinkmanship. We said that Russia is likely to probably achieve its ends, its aims only by taking this to the last. We were applying a lot of rationale. We were applying a lot of reasoning. We were applying a lot of uh, historicity to this and uh, drawing our conclusions. Now I realize after the first 24 hours of the commencement of the war that none of this is true. You cannot apply any of this to the current European theater. Russia is doing things out of the box. Uh, Putin is doing things which are unpredictable at the moment. And that's how we should take it. He is willing to risk a lot. Uh, and there's a lot hanging because of that risk at the moment. Uh, internationally, there has been tremendous concern. Obviously, headlines all over the world. Uh, it's a networked world. It's a globalized world. We are all aware. Uh, Beyond the Cold War, at the time of the Cold War, these kind of networks didn't uh, exist. I do recall 1973, when the Yom Kippur War broke out between Israel and Egypt and Syria at that time, the price of uh, petrol in Delhi went up from 90 pesa per liter to approximately 3 rupees a liter. Uh, I, I, I had a heart attack almost. My God, I was a very young man driving a motorcycle, and I just could not afford that kind of a cost of petrol. So this is exactly what's going to happen even now, even almost 50 years later. That's exactly what is going to happen. The world is going to, the world's economy, globalized economy is going to get afflicted very badly. You're going to find sanctions probably coming up and sanctions working in a hard way. Uh, how many countries join in? How many countries don't join in? You'll find a bifurcated world. So the in world, the global uh, economic system itself will go into a, into a bit of a turbulence. All this is going to affect humanity all around the world. It's just because of one area, Ukraine, 48 million population uh, existing there. The intention of NATO to try and integrate it as a part of NATO, bring it across and uh, threaten, um, not threaten really, but uh, continue to pressurize Russia. Russia has actually taken umbrage to this whole thing finally and said enough is enough. And you've crossed, you're crossing the red line. I will now cross the red line myself and go ahead to do what I would think is correct. And that's exactly what Putin has done. Now, the last part of this question, I must say that Putin has taken advantage of one major phenomenon which has happened here. And that is the refusal of NATO, American-led NATO, to actually put boots on ground, uh, not show a stomach for a fight. If, the, if, the, if NATO had shown a stomach for a military confrontation, I don't think this would have come to pass. So this is something that we could always discuss further. Uh, Sir, so taking it forward, uh, you know, uh, I think Ukraine got a raw deal because earlier everybody said, you know, that don't worry, we are behind you. Something happens, we're there to fight for you. And with the, by that, we mean all the Western nations led by US. Now, suddenly nobody is wanting to put their hands into the crisis at all. So uh, Ukraine is finally standing all alone. What sort of a situation is this, sir? I think Ukraine has been very naive about this, if you ask me. They haven't studied uh, the historicity of, this, of these kind of conflicts to find that the West will only come in 
with boots on ground where their extreme interests are involved. For example, when 9-11 got hit, America's dignity got hit, right? America's pride and ego got hit and they had to get back. They had to get into Afghanistan and they had to send out a message with us or, 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 or against us. That is it. I mean, you can't have an in-between kind of a situation. That's the kind of messaging which George Bush was putting out. But today is a different world. It's a different world. The Americans have just come out of uh, Afghanistan 20 after 20 years. Uh, they've not had a very, very uh, uh, great exit as such. The whole of NATO hasn't had a great uh, exit at all. So the, six months later to come together and think that you can put together an operational coalition to once again go back into Ukraine and defend Ukraine with boots on ground. I think Ukraine itself was being very naive. And uh, Ukraine should have been much more forthcoming, perhaps, towards Russia, right? Uh, it, I, I think it was unnecessarily being a little confrontationist at this particular time. Therefore, should have been a little more compromised, uh, live to fight another day, so to say, live to fight another day. Either you're prepared to take all the, circ uh, all the circumstances which come with all this, but then you can't complain. And if you have not done your brainstorming, if you have not done your discussions in the back channels, if you have not spoken to your so-called allies, then obviously some major mistake has been made. The Russians have been very clear. The Russians have staged this entire thing. They've discussed it perhaps to the hilt. And if you've seen in the last three weeks, the visit, the summit in Beijing, which actually added weight to this whole strategy. It is the final backing from China, which has actually given Putin the, the, the courage to perhaps take this kind of a risk against NATO and the rest of Europe. Right, sir. And uh, sir, you know, we Indians are uh, old Russian friends. And uh, yesterday, the U Ukrainian ambassador requested our prime minister that he should have a word with uh, the Russian prime minister, Russian president, which he did. So where, what do you think could be the stand India will take and India will continue with it, trying to maintain a balance between a very good friend and a friendly nation? Lots of us are analyzing this. Lots of us are writing on this. And I think the, the core argument which is coming out everywhere is that India has to consider its own interests. Uh, it is self-interest. Nations don't go around doing things for the interest of others. They do it for their, 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 their self-interest. The self-interest in the case of India is to go along with the United States, the future, a strategic partnership, Quad, Indo-Pacific, the, the, the complete maritime domain, this is so important for us. Along with Russia, because our northern borders, our northwestern borders, the area of Central Asia, Pakistan, and Afghanistan, the events happening there, all are influenced by Russia and the presence of Russia, the new great game, so, as so to say. So we have to be equally with them. We've had a historical past of an excellent relationship with Russia, which we do not want to leave. We have, had, we have been the beneficiaries of many things from there. Uh, the, the S-400 deal uh, recently, which has been, of course, to mutual um, uh, advantage to each other, right? But uh, having said that, India is today not in the position and condition that it was when it was a non-aligned nation. At that time, no one looked at this seriously enough. In India's position didn't really matter as to who it sided with. Even its neutrality didn't matter, right? Now India carries weight. A almost a $3 trillion economy heading to be a $5 trillion uh, economy, a, a very large set of armed forces, one of the largest uh, uh, weapon buyers of the world at the moment, and emerging to be a much, much bigger power, a middle power, so to say. So India's opinion matters today. And people are seeking India's opinion and seeking India's side. What must India do? I call it, well, you can call all kinds of terminologies in international politics. I call it informed neutrality, right? Your neutrality is there. You cannot afford to take sides. And anyway, in this war, it's too early yet to take any sides anywhere, right? Uh, this is the time when we must continue our advisories to both sides. In the case of last night, you saw Prime Minister Modi also gave out the same advisory, restraint, right? Uh, do not cross uh, certain red lines, do not uh, abjure violence. And that kind of a messaging is going out from India. We are fortunate we've got a foreign minister at the moment who's a professional diplomat. And therefore, it is easy for him to articulate. For example, you saw in Melbourne, 
the manner he is man, manner in which he managed to ensure that the uh, quad conference was not hijacked into a ukraine conference right subsequently he spoke at the munich security summit also and rationalized reasoned the entire stance that india is taking in terms of its neutral neutrality same thing in its advice which it is given he gave to uh, uh, the, the french in in france when he went and visited france so i think overall india's stance is a very very informed stance now ultimately it will come down to the security council and we are a member of the security council a non permanent member of the security council i think the issue if it comes up there will of course get uh, neutralized by russia itself will get vetoed by russia itself but india will be required to perhaps express it is its opinion there uh, i i foresee that we will be forced to abstain we cannot afford at this stage and that may not be taken very kindly by the western world uh, how deep are these memories well uh, yes memories are deep sometimes and Uh, as we go along this this kind of a thing will be remembered is there and uh, you know human memory is all there is all recorded so it will make a difference there's not some time you know in the whole relationship with the west with the united states and things like that but we cannot afford to have a situation where we are pushing russia into the hands of china expect getting a greater sino russian kind of a uh, equation strengthening that equation because ultimately that is what will encourage china to do what it wishes to do against our northern borders so i still believe that what we are doing is the correct stance informed neutrality is the terminology which we should be using more often and so you know imran khan had just gone to russia and uh, you know that was ju- just after we abstained from the voting and uh, so what what message did that leave and uh, did it leave a bad taste in the mouth for anyone <laughs> so that's a very good question if mr imran khan is uh, one of those who's got a knack of uh, landing up in the wrong spots perhaps um this uh, visit was planned about 3 weeks ago when he had gone to uh, beijing if you remember at the inaugural ceremony of the winter olympics and from then he came back and this whole thing was organized and he was to go to moscow someone yesterday asked me this question that was this a setup <laughs> was russia actually wanting to carry out this operation even while imran khan is sitting in in moscow but i i think that's an exaggerated uh, bit of a conclusion yet putin met him for a fairly long time yes, uh, yesterday and uh, they must have discussed the ins and outs of central asia etc pakistan is important for russia let's let's accept it let's not wish it away that pakistan is unimportant russia wants a relationship with pakistan you have to remember the central asian region is something which russia wants to control it cannot afford not to control what happened in kazakhstan recently has actually shaken up uh, the, the russians to, to to some extent if uh, and is this area of northern afghanistan from here if uh, a lot of terrorists a lot of radicals start moving into into central asia taking advantage of the weak economies there uh, taking spring, uh, advantage of the the weakness of the of the government some of the governments there the russians are going to be up in arms this is something which will threaten their um, soft underbelly you know chechnya dagestan there's a fairly large muslim population there all this they believe can be controlled if pakistan is on board with them because pakistan is the sponsor of all this in this area similarly the chinese have a similar uh, issue uh, regarding xinjiang where an indian 18 20 million population muslim population exists and they don't want that kind of a thing happening from the pakistani side there you see pakistan government may be with Pak- with china but they don't want some things happening from the clergy from the um, you know unorganized people etc the influence uh, reaching in these areas so they too are looking at pakistan with a kind of a glad eye so both of them russia and china are together on this uh, as far as pakistan is concerned so this is an important relationship not something which we are very happy to have developing in this manner but uh, it's not something that we can write off and this is not something that we can just ignore right a lot of people are passing awkward remarks to say what is imran doing there and things like that as i said imran pakistan is an important country for pakistan for for russia and imran khan's visit there at this crucial juncture is an important aspect which we should not sort of ignore 
Right, sir. And sir, uh, from Pakistan, we moved to China. Now, China, you know, is a great Russian friend. She and, uh, uh, you know, Putin have both uh, shown this camaraderie off and on. You know, like that cooking, you, you remember they were cooking together in the kitchen when the, she had gone to Russia. And, uh, you know, there's certain, this was very nice, warmth, feeling, vibes, which come out of their relationship. Now, is it this situation, uh, we, we have, we uh, in India do not take stands huh, when it, so we okay feel they are friends, but we are also friends with Russia. In such a situation, sir, would uh, our stand with Russia make an effect on the growing Russian-Chinese friendship? Or, uh, you know, we, or we stand where we were as good, great friends to Russia? So, you see, um, this is a mutuality of interest at a particular juncture. China and Russia do have a mutuality of interest at this moment against the United States because the United States is the one which is looking at preventing or neutralizing the rise of China, which is happening in the Indo-Pacific at the moment. The Russians were considered as the swing kind of a state at the moment because they were not considered too powerful uh, as such. The economy was not considered such anything so great. But I recall now what happened in 1969. When Henry Kissinger, when President Nixon came to Delhi, from here went to Islamabad, and within one year you found ping pong diplomacy. What was ping pong diplomacy? The Americans, who were not in the best of books with the Chinese, decided you couldn't keep China and Russia both as enemies at that time. They decided to make sure that they befriend China, get China out of the mode of the cultural revolution, assist it in its economy, in its modernization, in its uh, technology acquisition, etc. And this is how exactly how China has come up in the last uh, 50 years uh, or so. Now, this is exactly what the Americans uh, should have done against the Chinese by developing a strong relationship with the Russians at this time. Exactly the opposite has happened. Right. Uh, instead of developing the strong relationship, they have pushed Russia to the hilt. They have um, they've used NATO to try and impinge on the uh, near abroad region of Russia. I think this has been poor strategic thinking on the part uh, of the United States. So what they've uh, done is that they have driven Russia and China together. Now with Russia and China together at this time, temporarily, as I said, I, I still say it's temporary, it's not permanent. There's no permanent friends, no permanent enemies. The Russians do not like the Chinese, let me tell you. But now if the Russian economy does well, at the moment, of course, the doubts are there because of uh, sanctions and things like that. But in the future, if the Russian economy does well, the Russia keep com comes back with comprehensive national power, etc., you will find competition between China and Russia emerging once again. Right? The, the Chinese are not too happy to have the northern stretch, the whole stretch of of Russia right across their borders on the in the, in the northern flank uh, at all, right? So having said that, we in India, we should be concerned about a Russian-Chinese, or uh, not a it's not a rapprochement, it's a strengthening of relationship which is going on uh, at the moment. Because uh, if the Chinese take uh, the weight of Russian support to impinge on our borders and coerce us further, we are going to be in an awkward kind of a situation with the Russians not supporting us, right? We will look for Russian support. We will look for American support. We will look for the international support completely, right? That's the policy that we should be following uh, for the future. And that's one of the reasons, primary reasons why we need to be very cautious in taking sides in this conflict. Right, sir. And sir, uh, uh, one little thing which uh, seems little, but it's very huge at the moment is, uh, you know, Russians, uh, the Russian president, I won't say Russia's Russian president, yesterday warned all those little nations in the vicinity and said, don't try it, you know. So uh, what happens, you know, can these nations get together and form a clique against Russia? Can they get together and go ahead and join the United uh, States and its allies? Uh, what can happen, you know, they are all small individually, but together, you know, it makes a great force. There are 30 countries today in NATO. 14 of these entered uh, post the end of the Cold War. So many of them belong to the, are the former republics. For example, the three yes. Baltic republics on top itself, right? Uh, you have uh, 
other countries, Poland and Hungary and countries like this, right? The, the warning which is going out is essentially to all these countries is to tell them to lay off, right? To lay off. And they, they all, I think the Russians are essentially passing this, this kind of a warning because they also realize that uh, the American and NATO leadership unity is not there at the moment. Without a, the unification, without that kind of a leadership, individually, none of these countries can do uh, anything as such. Uh, I think it's just a shot in the air that the Russians have, have, have carried out by sending out this warning just in case a contingency develops and someone is tempted to do something like this, right? Uh, of course, opening up of borders, like Hungary, right? Uh, Poland opens up its borders, or Romania opens up its borders to take in immigrants, uh, take in foreigners, etc., is not considered as support uh, in a war of this nature. But if they use their territory to allow NATO material to flow in out here, uh, allow proxies to move here, allow uh, um, you know some kind of information warfare, any kind of hybrid conflict, then they will be directly accused by the Russians. Uh, and the Russians may well wish to demonstrate this by, you know, trying to threaten some smaller country, like in the case they did in, in the case of Georgia at one time. They may just threaten one of the smaller countries. Right, sir. And sir, uh, we go ahead to the, you know, there there are major financial economic sanctions on Russia. How will they affect Russia? Sir? See, the, of course, a, a good financial analyst is needed to see this to to answer this. But to my mind. Yes. To my mind, uh, the fair amount of paralysis in terms of Russian investment capability, Russian international uh, financial capability in the sense, the SWIFT system, for example, the SWIFT system, which is used for banking, international banking, uh, will no longer be applicable in this case. Uh, I went to Iran maybe a year and a half, two years ago, and I found Iran under the sanction, and therefore you couldn't even use a credit card. You have to cash, carry cash everywhere. Dollars were being used, but being used as, as cash, right? So uh, tourism goes for a six completely. The ability for Russians to travel with their credit cards, that itself goes for a six. So the nation is affected. It's not just credit cards, it's also trade. It's all about investment, right? Uh, a lot of exchange of goods here and there, exchange of services and things. So by and large, a paralysis of the system, the Russians have withstood it, uh, withstood the sanctions so far. But to my mind, these sanctions may not have been as strong as they're likely to be uh, in, the, in the near future. Uh, um, the, the Russians have uh, contracted $117 billion worth of energy supply to China. This is, some, this is a substantial amount. But uh, that itself is uh, not sufficient to sort of compensate for the losses that the Russians are going to have in the near future. So this is definitely, it's a, you see, this is a typical hybrid condition where different factors at different points are cause, going to cause this friction. How quickly will the, will, will the economic sanctions come into effect and how quickly will they affect Russia? Will they affect the Russia at the, in this, during this window while the Russians are carrying out these operations? I don't think so. So the Russians may very well achieve their ends and uh, with whatever aims that they are looking at. And then... Uh, start a process of diplomacy once again. So all those sanctions, etc., are meaningless in that case. Right, sir. And sir, the last question, which is that, uh, you know, it's only day two of the conflict. Where do you see it going, sir? How do you see this conflict progressing? And do you see an end to it? You see, the um, Ukrainian president has already advised his population. There is a, there's a Ukrainian nationalism. 137 people have died already, they say, in the bombings which have taken place here and there. Although uh, the Russian president says that uh, there is no targeting of civilian areas, there's no targeting of any civilians and infrastructure and things like that. But inevitably, you will find civilian casualties will take place. Uh, so these are large, damage. Yeah, natural damage, large built up areas are there. So this kind of a thing will take place. Now, it's also a question of how much success the Russians get. So far, we are only seeing what is called the shaping of the battlefield, which is uh, cyber attacks, information warfare going on, a couple of missile attacks, 
some attacks on the command and control centers. But the physical movement, except for, I think, a few Helibon troops who have landed in that airport area of uh, uh, Kiev, and uh, the amphibious landings at Odessa, I don't think there has been a major in ingress of uh, mechanized forces, ground-based forces into Ukraine yet. Uh, this is what I learned. I may, 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 may be not very correct. Otherwise, it, but it will happen, of course. It will happen as we, as we go along. How much of a resistance are they going to meet? Are the Ukrainians prepared to give that resistance? Remember, Ukraine uh, has got a, well, it's got an army. It's got a set of armed forces, which is not anywhere near the Russian uh, armed forces. So uh, resistance may be put up. They will, it can happen for four days, five days, six days. At the end of the day, you'll find all these cities, etc., getting isolated. Uh, then there'll be a major, major problem for logistics of the cities, etc. And then you will find a general surrender. When you find a general surrender of that nature, you'll find possibly a Iraq-like situation emerging. That's that's I I I foresee um, uh, a NATO support, proxy support, which will give money and supplies and arms and ammunition and things like that to hit back against the Russians. Um, the Russians are going to find it awkward to be able to hold on these areas. 100,000 troops are nothing. 100,000 troops to hold an area as large as this is nothing. And fight back an insurgency is not anything. To, to get a very good idea about it, we had 100,000 troops in Sri Lanka. 100,000 troops in Sri Lanka. And it was difficult to control uh, what the LTT was doing at that time. Right. So uh, this aspect has to be kept in mind. Russia will have to bring in more troops, more equipment and keep it under occupation and meet the ire of the world. This is something the Russians have to realize that they are part of this earth. They are part of this world. They are networked to this world and they cannot take actions on their own forever. It can last for seven days, 10 days, 15 days, but it's not something to last for posterity. Thank you very much, sir. It was wonderful, as always, speaking with you. And, uh, you know, a subject which is unfolding, it's, it's, we don't know where it's going to go, but it's really something which our audience would like to know. And you really added so much of thought into everybody's mind that we know that when tomorrow we read the newspapers and then we realize, oh, this has happened, we know how to reconnect. The audience always wants uh, a real nice, explicit, uh, you know, information bank, which it always gets from you, sir. Thank you very much, sir. We are Thank you very you much. Back. Very kind of you. We are taking you back to our uh, studio in uh, Cyprus, sir. Chitali is waiting for us. And uh, Chitali, we are back to you. Thank you so much, sir. Thanks, really. It is uh, it had, as the situation is unfolding, as the crisis is going on, and on day two, something we got to know from an expert like you. Uh, this has been very much enriching for me, enriching for us. Thank you so much for coming again and uh, sharing your thoughts. Thanks a lot, sir. And if you, thank, thank you, you and Jai Hind. Jai Hind, sir. Right. Jai Hind. Have a great day ahead.